Laura Secord for me was in some ways um, not serendipitous, but um, or working on her, I should rephrase that, was not quite serendipitous. I mean, I had, was well aware of Laura, Sec Laura Secord's, you know, walk to Beaver Dams when I was uh, looking, researching my thesis, but she she did not show up very much. Um, she did not show up very much in the records. Uh, she was really not seen as, as terribly important by upper Canadian society. Um, but it's over over time, by the time you get to the early uh, 20th century, the historical societies and women's organizations in particular had decided that uh, the commemorations of the War of 1812, uh, and they fully understood those as celebrations of Canadian imperialism and Canadian nationalism intertwined, not separated but intertwined. And they also, you know, also thought that um, being part of, um, in many cases, the early women's suffrage movement, they thought that you know, what those celebrations needed and what Canadians needed in terms of national identity was a, was a heroine. And you can, you know, I can understand that. I mean, there have been lots written about the way in which women um, uh, as symbols of the nation are usually only classical or allegorical figures. They're not, you know, real historical women, flesh and blood women, um, whose histories we, you know, we can understand. And again, I think too, this also comes down to the the importance of, of history as a as a form of knowledge, as a as a wider form of of anchoring, what, you know, oneself and creating a creating a past for oneself means creating a subjectivity for, for oneself. So I so they you know they turn Secord into a heroine um, in some ways um, amusing you know adding details that we really don't know anything about such as you know what she was wearing um, what she you know what she thought in other ways adding details that I found more troubling such as imagining her relationship with indigenous people in various ways um, Secord herself uh, when she wrote about her encounter with the Kahnawake Mohawk just before she got to um, Lieutenant Fitzgibbon. Said, you know, I I had to convince them that I was not a spy, which is perfectly logical given the particular context. Uh, but I had to convince them I wasn't a spy, so they took me to him. She added a few more details later in um, the 1840s. Uh, she talked about being a little bit afraid, but by the time you get to the early 20th century, um, the you know the historical commemorators, including the white female commemorators, added all kinds of. Uh, reactions, emotional dimensions to you know to her encounter that she was terrified of them. She'd heard awful stories about them, um, that they you know they would scalp her and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, we don't really know. We have really don't know, and we can speculate as to what she might have made of indigenous people. Um, on the other hand, you know, on the one hand, she had um, spent part of her early life. She was born in Massachusetts. She might have been exposed to captivity narratives um, of the 16th and 17th century that often featured indigenous people uh, you know as demons uh, on the other hand she'd worked in her father's tavern um, in Upper Canada so she also might have encountered them because we know that indigenous people did enter taverns in this period so we just don't know uh, but what fascinated me was the way in which these people really needed Secord um, in so in so many ways and then of course she was attacked by William Stewart Wallace at the University of Toronto in 1930 um, not because Wallace doubted that she'd actually made her walk, but that he thought the walk had no significance, that the Mohawk had got there first. Um, but what, you know, and again, what I saw was really quite interesting was although people to some extent started to give up on that part of the uh, of the story. They would say, okay, yes, she, she committed a brave deed, but the story persisted. And I think also, too, the fact that the candy company came along in 1913, <laughs> uh, that was one of the you know reasons why Secord's story um, persisted um, and the ways in which the candy company used that, used that story um, dropped a lot of elements out of it, particularly the presence of, in, of indigenous people, um, but used, you know, used images of Secord and then created a history of themselves that had um, to do with uh, purity, a legacy of domesticity, a legacy of, of artisanal um, creation. Uh, that, those were, the, I think, quite, you know, kind of fun and fascinating uh, parts of the story. And then, then, you know, we get to the 
commemorations of the War of 1812 today, uh, and Sea Corps continued to, to be part of, part of this. Um, I've actually spent a bit of time working with a group called the Friends of Laura Sea Corps in the Niagara area who have um, recreated her walk. Actually, parts of it, of course, can't be recreated anymore because there are shopping malls um, on, on that trail, but they have, as best they could, they have re recreated the walk. And they're, very, they're interested partly in making sure that uh, the image of a woman has been part of the commemoration of the war, but also, too, in uh, tr seeing, seeing that the war could be remembered in different kinds of ways. So when they recreate the, the path, they, um, they are interested in incorporating far more indigenous narratives, um, putting together um, GPS walking assist systems and you know, um, I iPod versions that will allow people to um, gain knowledge about plants, for example, in the area. Um, you know, trying, you know, trying to diversify the, the, the narrative um, in different, different kinds of ways. And I think in talking to them in the face of a federal government that has, has had more to say about indigenous people, but has had little to say about women um, in terms of its commemoration, and has emphasized only the military and, uh, and the, sort of the martial aspects of the war. The cow was added in the 1860s by one of the textbook writers. There's you know, no evidence that of, of that cow at all, <laughs> and highly unlikely that she would have should have taken a cow. She took her her niece with her for part of the walk, but she didn't take the cow. Um, but the cow ends up being added, and I think the cow, of course, ends uh, ha helps domesticate Secord in so many ways. It's already domesticated, unlike someone like Madeleine de Verchere. She doesn't, you know, Secord didn't take up arms. She's not um, accused of acting in any way that's not congruent with with the you know, ideals of 19th century femininity. Um, but the cow, of course, helps sort of reinforce that. And then the, the story that I was told by people at the candy company is unfortunately they have almost no corporate records at all. They have a very rich visual um, arch archive of advertising, but no, and I think because they have They've changed owners so many times. There's nothing left, but they say that that Frank O'Connor, the senator who founded um, the candy company, chose Secor because he associated her name with purity and domesticity, and I think whiteness too. Um, and I, I, you know, they, they don't say that, but I've also found a brochure, um, one of the few bits of textual information in their archives, that um, was a hiring guide for women, uh, for managers to hire um, staff for the stores in the 1920s. And one of the things they were very, you know, sh the person should be pleasant, the person should be well, well turned out, the person should be clean, and if possible, blue-eyed and blonde. So I think, that, and when I look at the advertising and the, and the, the way in which they stress whiteness, um, which to be, certainly does, of course, have a relationship to selling confectionery. You know, you want to make sure that people are, um, are getting something that hasn't been adulterated or tampered with and that's safe. But at the same time, I think there's that underlying theme of, of the whiteness of Secord.